Labas vakaras, ar kartą ačiū, kad atėjot. Ačiū, kad palaukėt už ką labai atsiprašau. Nes mūsų svečias, Radinas Mūšė, Leonas, labai labai smausus. Aš jau negalėjau ištraukti iš panerių, aš jau negalėjau ištraukti iš trakų. Jisai užklausinėjo karainų bendruomenę klausimais už pylę, negalėjau ištai nekaip išėjti. Pabadžiau gyvasi galėdamas pristatyti Mūšė, antrą kartą pas mūsų bibliotekai. Jisai... Šiuo. Šiuo. Jisai prieš atikdamas į Lietuvą jau antrą kartą. Jis gal pats papasakos, kad jis jautėtis iš Palaukio iš Jonavos. O, atėjus. Senelis iš mokinos pusės iš Seirijų. Bet Lietuvoje jisai tik antrą kartą ypatingą ją dabar atranda, domisi ir jisai, bet tos biografijos trumpos, kurią aš aprašiau, jisai labai labai geras kambėtis. Jisai pasiūlė visą temų sąrašą ir jis galėjo čia turbūt visą paskaitų kursą, nes ir visos būtų nemažiai įdomios, tarkim, budizmas ir judaizmas arba kaip kaip ortodokso žydio akimės matosi budizmas, islamas, kaikščionybė ir kitas religijos ir apie judaizmo kryptis ir kad toliau panašiai. Bet aš išrinkau iš visų tų pasiūlytų temų, temų tokią, kurios buvo jau kai kurie mūsų draugai, bibliotekos lankytojai, mano pažįstame draugai, tai yra visi. Ir ypač tokie, kaip jų tarpi buvo verslininkų, kurie sakė, žinai, būtų labai įdomu, kaip judaizmas apsprendžia, kaip jisai verčia verčia žydus daryti biznį, dalyvauti versle, kaip jie elgesi su pinigais, kaip su klientais, kokį vaidmenį šitose verslo ir finansinėse ir transakcijose ir darbinėje veikloje užima būtent religiniai principai, jeigu yra tas žydas, verslininkas tikintis ir laikosi religijos savo priesakų. Tai aš išrinkau šią temą ir mėlai sutiko, kad būtų įdomiau ir būtų labiau tokia pagaunantė tą temą, pavadinam taip, kad žydai ir pinigai. Ir esu patyręs savo kailių, kad kartais net šitą vien šitų dalykų sugrėpinimas, kaip kur nors laikomas ne visai politkorektiškų. Sveiki, mūsų feisbuko puslapėje tiesiog paskelbėjau iš knygutės patarlę anglų kalbą ir išverstai iš visokių jidiš tokių pasakymų, kad reiškia toks jidiš posakys, kad jeigu tau kišai nedaug pinigų, tu gražiai šoki, gražiai dainuoja, gražiai kalbi. Nu, reiškia, kad tu visiems tada patinki, jeigu tu daug pinigų. Kai paskelbėjau šitą seną žydžiką patarlę, Net iš Australijos žmogaus muzėjaus buvo tokia šauktų, kai gaustų, kai ką aš darau, kaip aš dristu, sėti žydus ir pinigus, kad tai yra nemandagų, kad čia negražus, kad tai yra stereotipų toliau skatinamas ir visą kitą. Moše taip negalvoja. Tai aš tikrai žinau, kad jis yra nuo stabus kalbėtojas, bet jis nemėgsta mokslinių konferencijų, laiko, kad ten pranešimai yra nuo bodus, visi kalbų patį savo, kolegos klausų, jis dažniausiai, kaip matysi, mėgsta užmėgsti tokį gyvą kontaktą. Kažgal įspėjo, kad jis turi klausos sutrikimą, būdamas dar Vietname, karo metu Katalionas, Amerikai Šarnijose, daug spraidė iš bazės į bazę, ir lėktuvų motorės buvo labai garsus, ir nuo tada jam pradėjo sutriko ir pradėjo blogėti ir blogėti klausą, Jis dabar yra su tokiu kokliarimu implantu, kur stiprinėjom šiek tiek, bet šiaip, kada norėsit užduoti klausimų, bendrauti, labai svarbu žiūrėti jį, nes jisai gerai skaito iš lūkų, ką žmogus kalba. Tai va toks tik tai techninis įspėjimas. Mūsų jau jau kvartį brief introduction of yours. Aš sakau, kad jūs jau 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 You you gonna learn us how to how to become rich <laughs> and to do it in Jewish way, okay? <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> joking in a way, but but still, you know, the topic is Jews and money and the principles of Judaism in business and, and how 
an observant Jew should be behave or how should we uh, make a money? <laughs> Tell me how, how much time exactly must we stop? Uh, we are free people. This is free country. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> it's, it's now virtually six thirty. Okay, so if you talk longer than one hour, we will start giving questions. But if you want, you feel like getting into conversation, so okay, we, I got it. The I public is under control. I got my answer. Good to see you again. Wow. Uh, Barbara, I want you to be the timekeeper, which means. In a half hour, I want to let her know that a half hour is used up for you. And then after that, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, 5 minutes, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay. Um, how many people think that they will have no problem with understanding my English? You. If you think you can do it, you know, okay. No problem. Okay. Those of you who did not raise your hand don't understand what I'm saying, but uh, somebody can say in Lithuanian, sit next to somebody who understands and go, what did he say, what did he say? I am used to that because I don't hear. I started as a rabbi 50 years ago, this month, May the 9th, 1969, I finished rabbinical school, and at that time, the need for rabbis was not in Vilnius or Kaunas or Tennessee or California or Florida. It was in Vietnam. The United States was fighting a very, very, very serious and devastating war, and they needed a chaplain, a rabbi. They had priests, ministers. They needed a rabbi to go to Southeast Asia. I could choose not where I want to go, but which branch of the service. I went to the Air Force, and I became a captain right away. I didn't even know how to salute, I was a captain. But my, I was the only rabbi in the entire United States Air Force for all of Southeast Asia. So, my job was every day to get on a plane and go to another base and meet the Jewish men. They are only Jewish men because there were only men there at the time. And, um, and to visit with them and make Shabbat with them and talk about their issues and so on. In addition, every day, all of the priests and the ministers would go out to the flight line, which is where the, the fighter jets and the bombers would take off. And the, the jets would be like this, and the pilot would be looking down, and they would make the sign of the cross. What am I going to do? Magain David? <laughs> you know, it looked like I'm uh, uh, doing a judo or something. But I did not want to stay away because it would look like I don't care about them. So I would come and I would wave and say shalom or whatever. We had Jewish pilots, but not so many. But it was important for me to show that I cared about everybody. But what affected all of this every day in a plane to another base was my hearing. And standing on the flight line with <laughs> hearing. It took about 10 years until I realized I don't hear so well. And since then, over the last 30, 40 years, down, 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 down. So now I'm at the point where with this here, with this here, I hear very little, and with this here is worse, nothing. So they, the military gave me a surgery here and a special hearing aid here to be able to try to understand people. Why am I telling you this? For two reasons. Number one, if you don't understand me, you should ask somebody because I'm always asking somebody, what did he say, what did he say, what did he say? Gilles Vanessa spent two weeks with me. Well, better part of it. We can have Barbara for two weeks. I'm always saying, what did they say? Please don't be ashamed or embarrassed to ask somebody. The second, <coughs> the second reason I tell you that is that when my hearing was good, 
I always loved teaching. But when I hear it was good, it was easy for me to engage and participate with a class, with an auditorium, with people. I always wanted interaction, questions, answers, back and forth. The problem with my hearing now is that it's hard for me to hear what people say when they have questions. And it's easiest to do all of the talking. You don't have to worry if you hear, if they don't, you don't let anybody say anything. I want to change that. I beg of you to interact with me. And if I don't understand what you say, if I can't read your lips because that's how I try, then I will ask somebody what you said. But what you say is very important to me. Finished. Number two. Before I start speaking, I want to say a few words. <laughs> I'm a very emotional person. I speak from the heart. And I had three experiences in less than 24 hours that I think are changing my life. One of them is we just came from Takali, Ta okay. okay. where the Karite community is. 70 people who are Karite Jews. They don't marry outside their community except if a Karite comes from Crimea for vacation, to be at the lake, to look at the castle, and boy meets girl, the parents are looking, and that's how they, they could meet another Karite. Except for that, has to be another Karite from their community both by mother and father. They won't accept one Karite parent. That had an impact on me I want to share with you because I think it has something to say about the Jewish life in Lithuania. The second experience that had a profound effect on me was yesterday we were in Kaunas and we went to the Ninth Fort. And we got there just as the lady was closing the door to the museum. I was here almost four years ago, three and a half years ago. Rimas took me to Kaunas, and we went to the Ninth Fort. And this, we went the same time, how we could be so stupid to go the same time today, yesterday, as we did four years ago. Because what happened? They were closing the door, and we couldn't get into the museum. <laughs> But I didn't know what I was missing. So we walked towards the, uh, towards the, towards the ninth fort, and it was closed. They said they closed at, you know, 4 o'clock. It was November. It closed at 4 o'clock, 1,600 hours. But all of a sudden, Rima sees there are guys working, men working, digging, digging. So he goes over to them, and he says in Lithuanian, I have a guest from California. Can he see it's too close and he's going away? Ba -ba 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 -ba. And before we do it, yes, come in. So we saw the fort. This time, I'm with Barbara. That's the love of my life. In Jewish, we say Basher. And she did not see the inside of Ninth Fort. And from the outside, it just looks like a prison. You don't have a sense of what happened there but we couldn't get in. So we walked to the big monument, one of the most powerful uh, sculptures of passion I've ever seen in my life. And there was a young man and his wife and a little girl, maybe not yet two years old, and a baby carriage. And I'm looking and he's, I said to him, Excuse me, do you speak English? He says, yes, I do. And he sounded like maybe he's American. Perfect. I said, um, so are you visiting from another country? Where are you from? No, he says, I'm Lithuanian. I'm from here. I'm local. I live in that little town right uh, near, near Nantford. Oh, I said, why did you come? <coughs> he says, I don't understand why you're asking that question. Why did you come? I said, I'm a Litvak, my father, Yanova, blah, 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 Jewish, blah, 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 blah. So now tell me, why did you come? And he says, 
because it's a beautiful day and we don't live far and I'm taking my wife for, and my little daughter for a walk in the park. I'm wondering, do people go to Auschwitz to take a picnic? I don't know. So I said to him, what do you think happened here? Oh, he said, I said, we missed going in. He says, make sure you come back to see inside. It's very interesting. I said, what happened here? He says, we don't know. No one knows. Because the Soviets said this. The Germans say that, the Jews say this, the Russians say that, and it's all in books. They all have books. So, do we know what happened? We don't know. How do you know who to believe? Besides which, it happened a long time ago. I, meaning that when I come with my wife and my daughter, I don't uh, worry about what happened then. It's all right, so I'm finished. I was very troubled because as a Jew, not as a rabbi, as a Jew, as a Litvak, I read the memorials. We will never, to the memory of the people, the 10,000 people of my family, we will never forget you. You will be with us forever. What do you mean you'll be with us forever? Here is maybe the grandson of somebody who lived at that time. And he is, and he is uh, saying, why do we do this? And I began to wonder, why are we holding on to those memories? By the way, I'm still going to talk about Jews and money, but I hope no, it's not a problem. Sorry, no, it's not, not that. that. No, okay. we have to come back home because we have to prepare dinner for 11 person and we have a curfew. <laughs> could you give, could you give Zulnitz your address? I would like to go. <laughs> we, we are waiting for you. <laughs> if you make dinner for 11 people, a little more water in the soup and you yes. make for 14 people. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for telling me because... Uh, I ask uh, for your leave. Okay, thank you. Sorry. No, no, no. Okay. I appreciate you telling me why because I would wonder maybe I should do it. No, 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 it's not for that. Sorry, really sorry. Have a nice uh, evening. Bye. And all my life, all my waking life, I've always been trying to preserve the memory of my father, family that were taken out of the house here in Yonava. I lined up a room. We have pictures. I won't forget them. I read about the Holocaust. I won't forget it. I'll keep the memory. Maybe that young man is right. What's the reason for keeping that memory? Am I doing any good to my father's brothers and his mother and his sisters and the aunts and uncles? They're dead. They don't feel anything. Am I going to keep this feeling on for my children? things I'm interested in. My grandchildren? Ancient history. Their children will never know anything about it. And it actually made me wonder why I devote so much of my life to keeping that memory. And then today we went to Ponar and I realized why that memory is important. And even though this is not my speech, this is the introduction to my speech, I have to share it with you because I never thought of this before. And I think it's changing my life. I came to the conclusion and I wrote in the guest book at the end. I realize we are not holding on to the memory so that the Jews who were killed and shot in the pits, in the pits, and Men, women, children to take off their clothes. Beg, 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 please, please, please. We are not keeping that memory to keep the memory of Jews alive. 
six million Jews perished, but one Jewish life that was murdered is no more important than one life of a gypsy, which is no more important than one life of a gay person, which is no more important than one life of a political prisoner. One of the things that I was raised with in Judaism is that life is of infinite value. And we don't say you are more important than you because you have more money or because you are smarter or because you're a doctor. There's no such thing. When something is priceless, there is no possibility of making one more valuable than another. The reason we keep these stories alive, or I believe we should keep them, is to remind the people of the world what can happen when you pick out any group and you stereotype them, you develop xenophobia, fear of their being different, you don't like that they are not like you, and you use words that demean them and make them ultimately into less than human. When you do that to a Jew, or a Gypsy, or a Russian, or a Lithuanian, or a Latvian, or a Frenchman, or a Hutu, or a Tutsi, or a Syrian, or an Iraqi, or an Afghanistan, when you do it to a lady in a market in Baghdad who comes to buy vegetables and she has her children and somebody comes up, her life is as valuable as a Jew who was shot in Panah. We are remembering this because we want to remind the world what happens when you single out one type of person and you say they are not worth living. What word did the Nazis use for murdering Jews? We use it. The word was exter do you know what word? Extermination. How do you say extermination in Lithuanian? Extermination. Extermination. You don't exterminate people. You exterminate bugs, rats, vermin, insects. By using the word to exterminate or liquidate, they were saying that these people who look like me, talk like me, eat like me, have sex like me, love like me, these people are not like me. They are worthless. And that's why Ponana is important. It's not the question of the monuments, how many monuments are the Jews and how many monuments to Soviet uh, prisoners of war. What's important is what happens when you make a group less than yourself. The reason it's important to correct the Soviet attempt to eradicate that there were Jews murdered in Ponar, 70,000 out of 100,000, is, is the danger of allowing a government, a leader, of an authority figure, a professor, to rewrite history. And that's my introduction to the question of Jews and money. <laughs> Why is this a topic that people are interested in? Why is that a topic that we would ask? We How about <laughs> Jews in medicine? Jews in the entertainment world? Jews in uh, uh, literature? Jews in crime? Jews in America, Jews in France, Jews... Why Jews and money? Does the topic itself ring of stereotyping one group of people? And I think the answer is yes. Do you agree? It's time for me to ask you. To, call, to make the topic Jews and money is basically saying that Jews have a connection with money that is different than the connection Lithuanians have with money, Latvians have money, French people have with money, Italian people have with money. 
It's different. The Jews have a special relationship with money. What's that relationship? Well, if you're in Hungary, the Jews and money is about George Soros, a Jew. If he was not a Jew, <coughs> he, could be, he would be called a member of the opposition. He would be called a communist. He would be called an American. But, not a, but when he's called a Jew, it's buying into the stereotype that Jews have a special relationship with money. What is that relationship, I ask you? What is meant, not what you think, what is meant by that Jews have a special relationship with money? It's some kind of stereotyping. That what? Uh, it is some kind of stereotyping. Yes, stereotyping. It's a stereotype. Right? Stereotype. It's right. coming from the past and no one cares about it simply takes the stereotype as belief. And that's it. They, they, said they don't even care how true it is. It's a matter of a belief that they stereotype. Yeah. They, you know, the stereotype means but still, still I think is... about one situation and I spread it for everybody of that group. Black people, they love to dance, they love to dance, they're good with women, good with jazz, black people. That's stereotype. Does that mean there are, no black, there are no black people who don't dance? There are no Chinese people who, who don't keep their heads down and eat like this all the time? There are no French people who don't like food? No, it's a stereotype for the whole group. What's behind the stereotype of Jews and money? History. History. What? History. History? Oh, history of Jewish uh, nation behind this. Because Jewish nation they have long history, 5,000 years. A lot of proofs in the Bible, you could find a lot of stories about Jewish and money. Interesting. Now other nations have such kind of long history written down. Interesting. Saying that in the Bible we can find a lot of stories about Jews and money. It's true that there are many statements about Jews and money in the Bible, even though it's before that we were ever called Jews, because Jews come from Judah, which is actually the kingdom in the south, as compared to Israel, which is the kingdom in the north. But that's besides the point. But interesting, every mention of money in the Jewish Bible is positive. There is nothing in the Torah or the prophets, nothing that says Jews love money. Jews will sell their mother for a dollar. Jews cheat. Jews will trick people for money. Nothing. And matter of fact, the Bible is filled about Jews at war. And uh, Joshua conquered the land. And David expanded the land, and Solomon led his troops, big war heroes. Nothing about uh, that, that uh, King David bought himself yachts. There's a problem there. Kings are warned, the people are warned, if you elect a king, do not let the king acquire too many horses and too many wives. The wives was not that they were afraid that the kings would have sex. The wife was afraid that they would make alliances with all of the different nations. Because they would come into a nation and they would make an alliance by saying, I will marry your daughter. They say to them, the king. And therefore, you're not, it's like a pact. You're not going to fight against me because my children are your uh, grandchildren. It's not from the Bible, not from the Jewish Bible. This is only my guess. It's your I guess. Do not, do not however, like this. however, you were not wrong. You actually were right. I don't want to tell you why now. Let me hold on. So, yeah, please. Can I ask? Do these stereotypes, do these stereotypes yeah. about Jews and money exist yeah. also for Sephardi Jews? 
or it's more kind of the Ashkenazi Jewish you know, Excellent thing. question. Excellent question. Is the stereotypes of Jews and money for all Jews, or is it limited primarily for Ashkenazi Jews and not Sephardic Jews? Anybody take a guess? That's an excellent question. I never thought of it. Yeah. I, I didn't think of it either. I think the question goes to the competition of the Catholic Church, where they adopted the principle in the Bible of not lending money for interest. And so a Christian could not lend money to another Christian for interest, just like a Jew could not lend money for interest to another Jew. Okay. But the Muslims, so, we also know that the Muslims in Islam you can't lend for interest either. He is definitely right on the right track. The difference between the Sephardic and Ashkenazic Jews is not Jewish values or attitude towards money, it's whom they were living under. If they were living under the Muslim Ottoman Empire, or they were living under the Christian Empire. A very big difference. Until recently, with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, Arabs, Muslims, throughout the world would not stereotype Jews with money as problems. It only existed in Christian European communities of which Spain was absolutely included. And when, king, when Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand expelled the Jews, they expelled them on the basis of that they deserve the guilt because they are money hungry. Where did they go from Spain? Where did they go? New York. I'll give you some choices. New York. <laughs> Uh, Casablanca, uh, Istanbul, uh, Damascus. Casablanca and Istanbul. New York is wrong. <laughs> Morocco, uh, Istanbul, Amsterdam, and 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 uh, and in Iraq, Baghdad, Lebanon, etc. They went mostly to the Ottoman world, to the Muslim world. What's the difference between living under Christians and living under Muslims, if you are a Jew, about stereotypes and money? First of all, are there any stereotypes about Arabs and money? <coughs> yeah, they're good. And you say yes. Yes, yes. Give me, a, give me one stereotype. I'm not saying it's true about all that. Well, they don't drink. They, a lot of them don't drink. What? They don't drink alcohol, so they. they no, 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 no. See, you're talking about Arabs and money. Well, well, because they don't they drink, money. They, they like money. They like to be in business. Oil. The stereotype about Arabs? They borrow ten, ten times oil, money, and. Oh, this is <laughs> new. Oil, oil. <laughs> Oh, no, they, I think in free markets they always bargain. They're always bargaining. Okay. They're always bargaining. You go into an Arab market, into the shuk in any country. I mean, any country that's, that's a Muslim country and Arab, Arab particularly, particularly Arab. You go into the shuk and you say, "How much is this?" And he says, "One hundred dinar." You say, "One hundred dinar." How did they not? Oh. I give you 80. Okay. <laughs> you pay 80. You go out of the store. And the um, owner of the store says, What a disappointment. <laughs> he doesn't know how to bargain. I'm not satisfied. It wasn't a good experience for me. The next person comes in, how much is this? He says, a hundred dinar. A hundred dinar? That piece of junk, it's not worth ten dinar. <laughs> what do you mean it's not worth ten dinar? I myself uh, would, would read it every night. He says, I won't give you more. Fifteen is the maximum. Fifteen? 
I paid more than 15 myself. Do you want me to give it to you for free? Why do you mean 15? No, I won't sell it for less than 70. 70? Are you crazy? I'll give you 20. No, I'll give you a secret. Finally, they come to an agreement for 40 or 50. And what does the merchant do? Sit down, let's have a cup of coffee. <laughs> Am I right? So the Muslims did not have a stereotype that Jews were money hungry. They were no different really. But Christians did have a problem. And that gentleman over there identified one of the two main reasons. What you said in the beginning was the Bible has the Jews depicted as money hungry. That doesn't exist in the Jewish Bible, or even that part that is the Christian Bible, it's called the Old Testament. It exists in one of the stories of the Gospel, where Jesus' disciple Judah, Judah, goes to the authorities and he identifies that Jesus is here in Jerusalem for the Pesach, for the Passover, and he uh, is going to celebrate it with the other disciples. And if they, and he knows that they want to arrest him because they say he's proclaiming himself king of the Jews. And the priests take out from their pocket 20 silver pieces and they put it in the hand of Judah. 20, 20. This Judah is one takes, story, but it is another story. <laughs> and Judah puts it in his pocket and he goes to the dinner because he's one of the 12 disciples. And Jesus says, one of you will um, be unfaithful to me. But that is my lot. And who is it? Judah. Not Matthew, not John, not Luke. I mean, none of the other disciples. How many Jews were at the table? Twelve. Twelve. What? Twelve. Almost. Thirteen. Jesus was a Jew. All his disciples were Jews. Judah, you could have said, Judah's an orphan. So orphans turn in leaders. Judah was a, a fisherman. Fisherman turned off. No, 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 no. Judah, Judah, Juden became a part of the, the stereotype of the Jews that the, that the Jews will sell their beloved leader for money. The second thing was that it is what he pointed out. The church made a restriction, or kept a restriction. Now, let me go back one second. When Jews moved to a country under Christian rule, they were not allowed to own land. Secondly, they were not allowed into the guilds to be coppersmiths, goldsmiths, doctors, whatever. What was left for them were to be merchants and to be tax collectors. And if they made money for like a percentage of the tax, they could lend it out to Christians and charge interest. It was against the law of the church found in the Torah that you may not lend your money to your member of your, your neighbor, your uh, a fellow, whatever, Jew, Christian, etc., at interest. So let me ask you, if you are going from, let's say, um, uh, Barcelona, Spain, to India, to buy spices and beautiful fabrics, and I come to you and I say, I have 10,000 uh, whatever the, cost, I mean, the, the money would be, 10,000 pesos. I'm going to buy all of those things. But if you lend me 10,000 more, I will just buy twice as much. 
and I would bring it back, and I would make a lot more money. You would say, what's in it for me? I'm taking a risk. You could get killed on the way. You could not come back. You could go somewhere else. If I lend you 10,000 pesos, I want something in return. As a Christian, I, you could not charge me interest on that loan. So who would invest? A Jew. They couldn't be in the guilds. They couldn't own land. They couldn't be farmers. They couldn't keep cattle. But they were, uh, became money lenders. When someone borrows money and they now owe more than they originally had, and the person has difficulty paying them back, they hate the bank. They hate the banker. They hate the money lender. So that is part, that's why in Christian Europe, Jews were regarded as having an unhealthy relationship with money. In the Ottoman world, that was not an issue. They were regarded as less status than a Muslim, so a Jew could not build a synagogue higher than a mosque. When a Jew was walking on the street, if it was an elevated part like a sidewalk, the Muslim was walking on the sidewalk, the Jew had to walk on the side. But they could still live freely. They could build synagogues and they could walk on the streets. In the Christian world, it became less likely. Yes? 30 minutes. Okay, thank you. And in the Muslim world, Jews were also lending money, or, or was it? In the Muslim case? world, I, I can't, I don't know enough to actually answer that specifically. But there was also a reason why Jews were in that field of money lending and tax collectors, in particular tax collectors. In order to handle money, what do you need? What skill do you need? Writing. What? Writing. Writing, <laughs> reading, accounting, mathematics. Right? In the Muslim world, they had those skills. The greatest medical schools, philosophy, astronomy, were in the Muslim world. By the way, the Muslim did not allow Christians to enroll in a medical school. But Jews could enroll in medical schools by the, by the Muslim world. In the Christian world, there was much more illiteracy. People did not know how to count. They did not know how to read and write. It was kept in the church for the, for the priesthood to the educated class. Whatever the reasons, I can't tell you why. But literacy became a an asset of the Jews, which translated in their ability to keep records and to know how much you owe, how much you owe the king, how much you owe the nobleman, etc. There was another factor. Jews were spread out. I don't know if you know this, but like in the uh, 17th, 17th, 17th century, maybe even the 18th century, Jews were not allowed to live freely where they wanted in Germany. In Berlin, I wish I remember the date, 50 Jewish people were allowed to live in Berlin. So if a person, if a mother and father had four sons and they grew up and they got married, they had to decide which son and his wife is allowed to, to come in because they would only be replacing two people. The others had to leave. And where did they go? Where there were other opportunities. Could be to England, could be to France, it could be to Switzerland, could be to Italy. Who were they? Brothers. So, if you are making a business trip, not to India, but you're making a business trip to, let's say, to, to Paris, from Spain, you had 10,000 pesos. Forget the borrowing. You did not want to walk around with 10,000 pesos here. 
because the customs and immigration says, write down how much you know. Even now, you can't go traveling with as much cash as you want. But then it was dangerous. Robbers, highwaymen. So they did this. The Jew in Barcelona, or Toledo, let's say, more Jews in Toledo. The Jew in Toledo would say, all right, how much do you want in Paris? 10,000 pesos. 10,000 pesos, okay, that's 15,000 francs. Give me your 10,000 pesos, and I will give you a letter to my brother in Paris that when so-and-so and so-and-so comes with this letter, give him 15,000 francs minus 2% commission, whatever the, whatever the going rate would be. And that way it was safe to travel like that. But Christian did not have that kind of connection because they didn't have to move. And also, Jews, they were not allowed to own land, so they realized they were not permanent. So they kept their assets in money because if all of a sudden the count says, in 15 days, out, that's what Ferdinand and Isabella did. They said August the 2nd, 1482, at midnight, no Jew is allowed in Spain. And right after that, no Jew allowed in Portugal. It was a disaster. Many, 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 many people died trying to get out with boats, just like the refugees today. So they kept their, they couldn't sell it, sell their house? In what? In two weeks? So they kept their assets in money. Jewels, gold, whatever they could. Anyway, I want to move ahead with my talk because we are only talking about what's wrong with the stereotype of Jews and money. It's not all bad. So, as a matter of fact, to encourage people to come to the library, this is a book that Jovenas gave me, that he have, I mean, to Len, that he has here in this library. I don't have this book. I didn't even know about it. It's written by a friend of mine, another rabbi. He's orthodox. I'm not orthodox. I'm not reform. I'm not orthodox. I'm in the middle. He's orthodox. He wrote a book. Thou shalt prosper. Ten commandments for making money. And this book is about how it's a good thing to make money. We don't have in the religious clergy the concept of a vow of poverty. In Christianity, there are theological reasons why it developed that a priest cannot get married and a priest should not uh, accumulate wealth. It wasn't always, obviously it wasn't always kept, but both with marriage and with uh, or women and children, etc., and with, with, uh, with a vow of poverty. But in Judaism, we never had a vow of poverty. There were poor Jews, and there were even Jews who were poor by almost decision. I'll tell you about one or two of them. But the, the um, so his principle is, it's not a sin to make money. It's a sin how you make the money. But he didn't go far enough. When I get back to California, I'm going to I call him and say, Daniel, you missed the 11th commandment. And that, anybody guess? I'll tell you, listen to his commandments. I'll go to you quickly. Okay. First commandment, believe in the dignity and the morality of business. Two, extend your connections to many people. Three, get to know yourself. Four, lead consistently and constantly. Five, change the changeable while you cling to the unchangeable. Six, learn to foretell the future. Probably talking about the stock market, I don't know. Seven, uh, no, that was the seventh. Eighth, know your money. Nine, act rich, give away 10%. Tenth commandment, never retire. This is not Judaism. This is Daniel Lapid. 
He's a right-wing Republican, very conservative, and that's his point of view. But he's a rabbi, so he writes it as if it's about Judaism. He missed the most important commandment that he's going to speak as a rabbi, I'm sorry to say. And that is, use your money to better the world. Not to pad your own pocket, not to make your life exceedingly great so you can have five houses and 19 cars and horses. Use your money to make the world better. Why? Why do you think that's a Jewish principle? In other words, what's Jewish? It's not Jews are not the only one with that principle. I think Native Americans have it also, maybe more than Jews. But what's the basis of that principle? Use your wealth to make the world a better place. It's easier. It's easier to be rich. Give me again. Uh, it's safer to be rich. If there are not too many poor okay. people around okay, you. Okay, <laughs> very good. For your own, do it for your own benefit. You, you are so right. You are so right. We see in the United States gated communities. Wealthy people develop, buy houses with the development. There's a big gate and they have guards. Now even if some of them have armed guards. And, uh, and the only thing is you keep out uh, the thieves. But who are the thieves? People who say, I want to be on television? No. They're people who are hungry, having trouble feeding the family. So the idea is, I'm going to use my money to protect myself. And you're saying, and I agree with you, you will never protect yourself. You <coughs> the best protection is raise the standards of poor people so they don't come to get your money, to steal your money. But even that's a reason for um, oneself. That is, that's a reason because to better your own life. You will be safer if you help poor people. If we had more people in Mexico lifted from poverty, they won't be trying to push into the United States. If you have more Syrians feeling safer they don't have to be refugees. They won't come to Germany. If you raise the standards of Turks, they'll want to be, right? But that's not a Jewish basis. That's practical. That's good for Danny Lappin. He would put that in. Equality. Why should you make this world better if you make money? And the answer is because the money is not yours. <laughs> You didn't do anything to really earn what you have. It's yours by accident. From biblical teachings in the Psalms, again and again you hear the phrase that the earth belongs to God. And again and again you hear rules and laws saying, you're a tenant, you're not an owner, what you have was given to you by God, and God is telling you, share what you have. The laws in the Torah, and the Talmud expanded on it, was that if you have a field, any size field, and you are ready to, to uh, harvest the field, you are prohibited from harvesting the perimeter. They used to think it was a corner, but it's the perimeter. In other words, if the field ends here, I cannot harvest this part. If it ends here, wherever it is, the edges of the field are not mine to harvest. They belong to the widow, to the orphan, to the stranger, and to the poor. You cannot even Cut it and say to a poor person, here, it's theirs. They have to have the dignity of labor. That's a law from the Torah. And it was taken very seriously. If you have an orchard and you want to take the fruit, when you take the fruit, you don't get all the fruit. I don't know if you ever picked oranges or strawberries or anything, but you never get them all. The Torah prohibits going back 
to the trees or the bushes after you did it once. What's left belongs to the poor, the widow, the orphan, and the stranger. The Torah says there will never be an end of poverty in the world. Your responsibility is to be concerned about the welfare of the poor, the widow, the stranger, and the orphan. Why those categories? Well, poor because they don't have enough. Widows, because they don't have the husband to, in ancient times, we're talking about two, three thousand years ago, they don't have the, the, the source of, of, um, of, of uh, produce and everything that would be, uh, enable them to survive. Orphans, same thing. They don't have that father who was a landowner. Strangers, because the concept was when the Israelites entered the land of Canaan, the land was divided amongst all the tribes, and every family got a portion. So, hundreds of years later, when people came from the outside, they were traders, they decided to stay, whatever, they didn't have land. So you had to leave that for them. That's their land. Another law from the Torah. Yeah. If someone is a workman for you, you have them build a fence, you have them pick fruit from a tree, you have them build a house, you are not allowed to say, thank you for your work, I'll pay you tomorrow. Why not? The Torah is a law from the Bible. You are prohibited from saying, I'm going to pay you tomorrow. Why? Tomorrow might What? Maybe there is no tomorrow for someone. Maybe tomorrow? No, tomorrow for someone. For someone, that's true. You don't know if this person has enough food to feed their family. Yes. They may have a baby who's starving. They may have this. You're not. You cannot delay the payment. The Talmud insisted on the right to strike. They considered a God-given law. If let's assume a poor person comes to borrow money from you, why would they want to borrow money if they're a poor person? They have a land, what's the problem? The problem is that they don't have enough money to buy seed. Or they don't have maybe the horse tied to or the ox to plow. So they need the money. They're not buying because they want to go to India and buy spices. They're buying money for the daily necessity. The Torah says, do not take their garment as a pledge, as a promise that they will pay you back. You say, okay, I'll lend you the money, here's a hundred dollars, but give me what you're wearing. Give me your jacket. Torah says no. Why not? Because it might be the only clothes that the person has. Because that cloak, it wasn't like a suit. It was a big piece of cloth with a hole in the middle. Put the hole on like that tied it like this, that was your garment. That may be what that person is going to sleep under at night. Today, during the day, it's his clothing. At night, it's his, it's his uh, blanket. If you say, I will take it as a pledge, and when you give me my hundred dollars back, you can, a uh, hundred euro, you can, uh, I will give you back your garment, person could be shivering at night. Here's a big one you're not going to believe. Again, this is not some sage somewhere in Europe or what have you. This is one of the fundamental principles of Judaism found in the Torah. It's a big one.
every 50 years. Do you know the word jubilee? How do you say it in Lithuania? Jubilee. How do you say it? Jubilee. Jubilee, okay. In Hebrew, it's yovel. Y is the j. Every 50 years, they sound the shofar, and all debts are canceled. All debts are canceled. They ran into a problem. What's the problem if you want to keep that rule? If somebody is borrowing money one year before the Yovel, you're going to have a hard time getting paid back. Because if they wait one more year and you come to collect the money, oh, did you hear the shofar? I don't know you anything. The Torah says, do not um, hold back the loan if you are near the Jubilee, or you will be punished and you will lose what you have. Did that happen? No. It was a scare tactic. It was like a parent saying to the child, if you don't finish your homework, <clears throat> You're not going to sleep tonight. Kids are going to go to sleep. Second, when would somebody sell their house? If you're in San Francisco, you would sell your house if you saw another house that was bigger and nicer, but the elderly couple died, they have no children, they have some niece and nephew in Vilnius, and they don't know what the prices are, etc. They pay an agent to sell the house. So, I know about this house, it's on my street. I will sell my house, and I will buy that house that's bigger for the same money, or I will add some money, whatever, and now I'll have a bigger house. That's not why they sold houses then. They didn't live in San Francisco or New York or Austin, Texas. They sold their houses because they needed the money for the farm to be able to sow seed and have produce. When the chauffeur sounded, all houses that were sold went back to the original owner. You want to know about Jews and money? Don't look to what the stories are stereotyped by by Nazis, by Germans, by this one, by that one, by Christians, by Muslims, etc. If you look in Judaism, you'll find he's a Republican. The source of Jewish values about money are found in our sacred texts. And they led people to do things like one of the great sages. They did not get paid to be a sage. They taught, but they didn't get paid for it. This great sage had a shop. Every day he would see how many people are going into the shop across the street that sold the same things that he did. Do you understand? Let's say he sold, I don't remember what, let's say he sold uh, cloth, or shoes, that's his old shoes. Every day he looked to see how many people are going to buy shoes across the street. When he had enough for himself, it could be 12 o'clock noon. He locked the door and he wouldn't let in any customers. In his own store, why not? Why would somebody who's in business close their store and let the people go across the street when he felt he had enough? For somebody else to earn. What? For somebody else to earn. He wanted to be sure that the other one, mm -hmm. the other, his, his competitor was making earning enough. Why would he think that the competitor is not earning enough? Why is it his responsibility? They're both in business. Why is it his responsibility to worry about the other person's business? Because, he said, when people have a choice, of where to buy, 
The goods are the same, the shoes are the same, the leather is the same. But they'll come to me because I have a reputation of being a great sage and a teacher. So for me, they'll come with honor. Oh, Rabbi so-and-so, if you have a moment for me, please, I would like to buy shoes for my daughter, etc. Tim, they would say, how much of this, how much of that, how much of this is that. So he closed his shop when he had enough to make sure that the other person would have earn a living. Rabbi Huna, every single, he had a house, this is what I learned about, about Lithuania, I never knew this. Litvox had houses where the front door opened to the market. And Lithuanians or uh, Latvians or anybody had the front door open to the field because they were the farmers and the Jews were the merchants. So the front door opened to the market for the, for the Litvaks, for the Jews, and the front door opened to the field at the, uh, for, for uh, the people who were uh, uh, farmers because they had to go in and out to the farm. He lived by the market, not in Vilnius or Columbus. He lived by the market in the land of Israel. Every day, when he was about to eat three times a day, he would go out to the market. And he says, Anyone who is hungry, let them come and join me in a meal. Every day, three times a day. Is this part of Judaism? Absolutely. At the Pesach Seder for Passover, before you have your meal, we have to open the door and say, in the same exact words, call the Kfein Yetzel Yochal. If there's anybody here who's hungry, let them come and sit at our table. 2,000 years later, we're still saying the same thing. I have more to say, but it's time to stop. Barbara told me, this is it, it went over time. <laughs> so I'm going to give you my last word. I was asked to give another talk here in, in, in Vilnius, and that talk is Contemporary Trends in Jewish Life. In that talk, I'm going to tell you what I think is one of the most unexpected and, or maybe I shouldn't say unexpected, one of the most um, exciting trends in Jewish life. If you go back to Vilna and the Vilna Gaon and those days, and you say to a person, even a child, what is the most important value of Judaism? They might have said, to study hard, to study the Torah, to, and to, 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 to practice all of the rituals. Today, in the United States of America, if you turn to the average child, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, maybe even over 20, and you say, what? is the most important value in being a Jew, they will not say great education. They will not say be observant of every ritual. The phrase that you would hear from them is tikkun olam. It comes from the main prayer at the end of the service, seven days a week, three times a day. Three times a day, seven days a week, Shabbat, holidays, everything. That phrase is tikkun olam, to repair a broken world. That is the essence of Judaism. And it's about, it took us a long time, but people are feeling free enough. They don't have to get into Berkeley and Harvard. They don't have to become doctors and lawyers, etc. What they have to do is make the world a better place because I was born into it. And while 
You may or may not believe that God made a world. I happen not to believe that. I, I'm not uh, a theist. But that principle that I am here by, not because I earned my place, but because I'm fortunate. I was lucky. And if I have money, or wisdom, or talent, my job is to use it to make a better world. So that's my speech. I hope that the Juvenus calls me again and says, we want uh, you to come back uh, to Vilnius and, uh, and meet our friends. Right. I recognize a lot of you, you just recently. Juliana. And I remember, as a matter of fact, he, I remember him. He was here. I was here almost four years ago. You were here then too, yes? I think so. Anyway, Shalom, I'm glad to have this opportunity and to hear you is very important to me. Thank uh, you. Moshe, Moshe. Uh, will you take questions that there are? Ask Bob, Thank you. because she's my timekeeper. No, I said yes. <laughs> questions. She says yes. I know. Fine. Okay, yes. Uh, yeah, of course. You don't have so, to restrict the Jews' oh, money. <laughs> I prepared a talk on Jews and sex, or Judaism and sex, <laughs> on trends of. Uh, uh, the difference the, you can ask me any question about it. If I know, I'll let this Yeah. yeah. You ask the question. Oh. He has a question. Yeah. How to make money. How to make money. Yeah. I will tell you, I want to give you an answer. What is the question? Years ago, about 25 years ago, there was a guy in my synagogue, a bachelor, handsome, he drove a Rolls Royce, he was very successful. I said to him, Why are you still a bachelor? Why are you not married? Are you waiting for the perfect woman? And he said to me, No. I said, Well, that's good because there's no such thing as a perfect woman. Oh, he said to me, You're wrong. I did meet the perfect woman. I said, Really? How come you didn't marry her? He said, she was waiting to meet the perfect man. <laughs> then I asked him the second question. How come you're so rich? I'll tell you his answer. I always made sure that the person I was dealing with earned money from our transaction. I never tried to get somebody, I never tried to squeeze somebody. It was my principle always to make sure that he also profits by it. Yes, the last thing, the Talmud says, Ezehu Ashir, who is a wealthy person? Hasamer Bechelkos. The person who can enjoy and appreciate what they already have. If you don't, if you're not satisfied with what you have, you'll always want more to be satisfied. And I don't think, I, I had a lot of rich people in my community, a lot. You heard of Qualcomm? Yeah. You heard of Qualcomm? So the two founders of Qualcomm were men in my congregation, both of them. You heard of uh, Steven Spielberg? Mm -hmm. My daughter is, the, uh, is, is in charge of all of his philanthropy. You heard of uh, Tesla? I have another daughter, she's an engineer at Tesla, she's only about 26 years old. I, I got to know a lot of wealthy people. And the ones who were satisfied when they had little, remained satisfied. The ones that I saw unsatisfied, so they needed more, they never were satisfied. Because as they made more money, they got into circles of people who had more than they did. Some less, some more. They always wanted to be like the people who had the most. 
And when they got there, it wasn't enough. And then you see the relationships in the families break up. Husband and wife and divorce and this and so on. Kids spoiled like you wouldn't believe. I didn't see happiness there. In the fellow from Qualcomm, his four sons. I officiated the wedding of every one of his sons. One of them became the CEO of Qualcomm. Another one um, became, another one was, uh, he did a different business, I don't remember. One of them was in, in uh, uh, did not, he decided to enjoy himself and so on. And one of them decided, what am I going to work for? I don't need any more. And he, he decided to manage the family's money to give away, only to give away. And he started great things. He built a high school for high-tech kids. Built one, they now have 16 in the United States. People who don't have enough are never happy. I think. It's an answer for you. I could be wrong. What was the question? I missed the question. How to make money. Oh, how to make money. <laughs> That's a wrong guy. <laughs> oh, I have a question. Okay, forgive. Mm -hmm. I started by telling you that we went to the Karai community. Where again? Okay. And I said they have a lesson for the Jews of Lithuania. The Jews of Lithuania are a small group. In Kaunas, 154. And in uh, Vilnius, how many? 2,000. 2,000. And I see that there's not much hope. In this town, they have somewhere between 50 and 70 Karai Jews. That's it. And they don't marry outside of their community, except if they are on vacation from Crimea or other places like that. They don't even trust the Karai Jews in Israel. But. They're not disappearing. And they don't worry about disappearing. Why? I asked the lady, you have a son and a daughter, whom are they going to marry? Why are they not worried? Why aren't you worried? And I can see why they're not worried. They enjoy and are proud of being Karai Jews. They love what they are. They don't have a, a sense of doom. They have a sense of pride. Now, in part, it's be, what I learned today, I never knew before, the Germans decided, they, they did research, they claim, and they examined the noses and the ears and then etc. And they said, the Karaites, Jews, are not racially the same as the Ashkenazi Jews. So they didn't arrest them, except for one. By mistake. They took one, right? Is that what you said? By mistake, yeah. What? One by mistake. Oh. Not, not deliberately, but by mistake. He was shot. Oh, by mistake. Yeah. By mistake. By mistake. So maybe without seeing the community deported, they're not depressed. But whatever the reason is, I think the solution to, to the Jews of Lithuania is not to forget the Holocaust, but to take pride and joy in what is written here before the Holocaust. To be proud of who we are, to be proud of our values, to be proud of our relationship to the world. In Hungary, he points to George Soros and says, Jew. Why doesn't he point to Albert, Schweiger, to, 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 to Albert Einstein and say Jew? Why doesn't he point to Jonas Salk, who invented the vaccine against polio, and say Jew? No. Only he's going to pick out the Jews with money. We cannot integrate anti-Semitism. That's not us. That's not us. OK. We make it. Thank you much, sir. Thank you. Next time I come, we won't be rushing in the traffic. 
will bring cake and wine and juice and fruit. Yeah, and that was stay long the idea. Sure. <laughs> well, thank you again. Thank you.